So we'll go with the order, uh, same order as the, the institution just laid out, epithelium, CC proper, biochemistry, cartilage, bone, and there's none of the CCPs and none of the basic tissues because there's no known test. That's majorly why. Epithelium. This is, you, you think of epithelium all the time, that's your skin. <sighs> Uh, so we talk about the embryonic origin, basic functions, common. These are, this is more for you than it is for the sponsors. So embryonic origin. We know that when uh, when you have this globule of, I guess the uh, your your egg, basically your egg and your sperm meet, you get you get mitosis of cells, and you get this giant like vessel form, basically what's going to become you. And in that vessel, you get three different different kind of segments. And the top, top layer is known as the exoderm the mesoderm, and the endoderm. What will happen is they will fold around and connect all their rounds, so the endoderm will actually become the inside. So if you can kind of picture that like wrapping around itself, you can kind of get how the ectoderm will become like the outer things, and the endoderm would become like the GI tract and all the insides, and the mesoderm would kind of become like the middle part of that. So endoderm is going to be like, again, touching the environment, ectoderm touching the environment, and the mesoderm rarely touches the environment, basically. You guys like that? Yeah, so... <laughs> OMS for extraterm, oral mucosa, and then gland skin, mesoderm, reproductive. This is all for you. Can just read it over. Okay. Definitely no oral mucosa is yes. the. Uh, Good. Functions of. <laughs> see, barely, I like them. Functions of epithelium. See, so barely a pass, and you know that their contractibility in them, myoepithelial cells specifically. We know do they do protection. If they do skin, they do protection. Uh, absorption. Uh, we know the GI tract has epithelium to absorb things, and we know the endoderm was in contact with the environment on the inside. Remember, your body is trying to protect itself, so there's only a few things that are in contact with the environment. Obviously, your skin on the outside is in contact with the environment, and your endoderm protects all the other stuff that's important, that's vital, that you're keeping at home stasis from the environment. So your GI tract is going to initially be the one doing the absorption to make sure that everything that goes into your body is controlled. So it does absorption, secretion, your salivary glands, your sensation, your olfactory, neuroepithelium, a uh, bit of that will be doing sensation, as well as your tongue epithelial. Okay. Um, what do they have in common? They have polarity, so one surface is different from the other surface. So apical surface is different than basal surface. They're avascular. They don't have blood vessels. They have some work to diffusion. Their renewal is really high. Remember, that's why we our tongue uses epithelial instead of neuronal tissue because they regenerate really quickly, and they're tight, inter uh, intercellular junctions, so they're usually connected very tightly together, again, to protect it from the environment, because they want to make sure that everything goes through a cell, not between the cells, okay, through a cell, not between, so if you tightly adhere the two cells, you can't go within, between the cells, okay. Classifications, three classifications for squamous, cuboidal, columnar, oh, no, sorry, transitional, that's the awkward one, squamous, flat, nuclei kind of bulges out, cuboidal, square, Nucleus in the middle, columnar, column-like, basal, and has the nucleus. Transitional, those are the ones that flip around. Those are found in your urea, or urinary bladder and your and your urethra. Ah, <laughs> uh, they're found in your urea. <laughs> uh, there's uh, different types within each one. There's simple, stratified, and super stratified. Simple squamous. These are the ones that are going to be uh, involved with your absorption. Oh, sorry, uh, blood lymph vessels. So not absorption. That's the absorption. Because absorption is. Here. Simple is more like just lining of things. So like your blood vessels are lined with simple squamous cells. Your lymph vessels are lined with your simple squamous cells. Um, your alveoli, which have to have diffusion through it. So diffusion, wherever diffusion's involved, that's where you're going to kind of get the simple squamous because they're really thin, one layer of squamous. Stratified, many layers are kind of become protected now. So you can have keratinized and non-keratinized. Keratinized, you protect. So it's like areas where you're going to get impacted all the time. Like your foot, your hand is keratinized. Right? Your hard palate, like the, the layer of that, keratinized. On the other hand, you have non keratinized, which is going to be like the softer tissue, so like the back of your throat or something like that. Uh, pseudo stratified, not applicable for this one. Cuboidal, stratified, salivary glands, we've seen that. Uh, cuboidal, simple, these are ones that are going to be in the, in the smaller glands and tubules. So you have your kidneys, your kidney tubules are going to have it, your ovaries are going to have this, and they're mostly for secretion as well as absorption. They're going to kind of do that, so in the kidney tubules, they're going to absorb the water. Or they're gonna be able to like excrete like or secrete the, the some of like the other electrolytes and stuff they want to, to kind of buffer the solution. Columnar, major absorption. So like your GI is gonna be lined with columnar, simple columnar, and basically it's gonna allow you to have those carbohydrate receptors on top or carbohydrate like uh, co-exchangers and exchangers. So you can be able to put glucose inside and exchange it for sodium and stuff like that and bring sodium and glucose inside at the same time. That's where this is happening. So simple columnar is doing that. 
uh, stratified, excre uh, excretory glands, and conjunctiva. That's the, really the only example of stratified coma that he really cares about. Actually, well, he's, wish, doesn't care. wish doesn't care about. He doesn't. He cares about yeah, he cares about it. Yeah, he cares about it. Uh, <laughs> and pseudostratified. These are the ones that have cilia. So pseudostratified columna, they have cilia. And cilia is important because it helps you move the mucus around. And most of these are found in mucus conflicts, upper respiratory tracts, goblet cells. Yeah, always Yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say, um, sweat glands are pretty important for the coma and the I mean, yes, they are. So they they would be in like the simple mm -hmm. as well as sometimes stratified. Yeah. Um, I don't. Th I think it's just small, yeah. small ducts and glands would be kind of like the ducts of like those circles. So one way I memorize this, okay, um, because it's a long chart and then it's easier if you just get to concentrate. So cuboidal, just think of round things. They're cuboidal round things, right? Ovaries, uh, uh, kidney. They're kind of round. Cuboidal are round now. Sure. No, round they're, kind of, they're more round things. Right? So um, first, are you serious? Come on. <laughs> Kidneys, they're rounder, right? Um, and Forget about the smaller ducts um, because you have ducts here. Um, with this one, columnar, simple columnar, I go G, G, G. So GI, gallbladder, and gland. Okay. Um, know that microvilli is going to be in the columnar series. Okay. Um, he, he didn't talk about pseudostratified having uh, microvilli, but don't, well, yeah, don't worry he's about just focused on Okay. Um, so that's one way to just remember these guys. Okay. And you know, characterize and non characterize. We did this already. We just yeah. did this. This is just to show that. Microvilli. So there's different types of microvilli. Um, the ones um, yeah, I don't think we mentioned them here. Well, stereocilia actually is a type of a microvilli. So isn't it stereocilia? Yeah. Yeah. Stereocilia is a type of microvilli. Yeah. Don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's yeah. Uh, it's it's just confusing. Yeah. Stereocilia is a micro microvilli. Uh, so microvilli, the increased surface area, and they're going to be found where you can have a lot of absorption happening. So your GI tract is where basically you're trying to absorb all the nutrients. If you increase the surface area by having microvilli, it's just more efficient. On the other hand, you're going to have cilia where you want to have motility. So if you want to move like mucus around, you're going to have cilia. Because they're thicker, they have the power stroke, not even that. <laughs> Keratinization, anywhere you have impact or kind of hard tissue, kind of like uh, tissue being like kind of impacted all the time. You're going to get the top layer of the epithelia, of the squamous epithelium kind of dying off, the nucleus kind of degenerating. And so therefore it just becomes dead epithelial cells keratinized in the top layer. Hold to your hands. So so for cilia, no axonies. Okay. Yes, um, axonia is just a way they're organized, so 9, 2, so 9 microtubules on the outside, 2 in the middle, that's the axonia. So 9 doublets? Yeah, 9 doublets, and 1 is, yeah, 2 singlets. Okay. Uh, surface specialization, these are the junctions we were talking about before. So tight junction is going to give you that seal between the things. So they're going to be on top, the apical surface is going to have tight junctions. They are your occludence junctions, and it's going to give you the seal between the epithelial cells. When they're sealed like this, nothing can pass between them. The more seals you have, the tighter the junction. The less seals you have, the more permeable the junction. Okay. Adhesion, this is going to give you the kind of like ability to contract, like to move together. Okay. So these are going to be done with your zon zonal adherence, which are your microfilaments, which are going to be your actin. On the other hand, it's going to be done by macular adherence, which are your, uh, your spot or your patch, patch junctions. Basically, that's going to be your desmosomes. zones. So zonal adherence, they have actin filaments on the other end of it. Desmosomes or macular adherence have your intermediate filaments. That's the difference. Actin filaments, intermediate. Actin filaments are the microfilaments. Intermediate filaments are the microtubules and stuff we talked about. Gap junctions, these are communication between cells. They're the same as heart, nothing's changed. Okay, so if they, if they ask what's keeping the cell um, integrity, what would be your answer? For adhesion junctions? It's intermediate. So integrity of the cell is intermediate. Because if, if you don't have intermediate filaments, you're going to rip the cell in between. Like, the one individual cell is going to rip in half. Other, uh, on the other hand, if you have oh. zonal adherence, yeah. it's going to rip between oh. cells. Oh. So if you don't have these ones, if you don't have microfilaments and zonal adherence, you're going to rip between cells. You're going to rip cells are going to rip apart from each other. On the other hand, if you don't have intermediate filaments, it's going to rip the cell within itself. So that's the integrity of the cell. Kind of gives you like that weld from like like the Statue of Liberty thing that we had in the cell of this. Kind of like all the lines going from one end to the other. Hemidesmosomes, these are found on the basal side. They're going to anchor your uh, epithelial layer to the connective tissue underneath. So basically what's going to happen is your hemidesmosomes are going to connect your integrins, uh, are going to be your integrins adhering to the, to, to the fibronectin, uh, which is binding to the collagen. So what will happen is you have your ectodermal layer, which is going to become the epithelium, and your mesoderm is going to become the connective tissue, and together they're going to be sealed together, and that's where you get the basement membrane. Okay, does that make sense? Because the ectoderm was already on the outside, 
the mesoderm are in the middle, or we can have endoderm too. Endoderm and mesoderm are then fused. That's a basal membrane. Okay. That's a, uh, it's important to know too yeah. that like the uh, basal lamina you can't see with light microscopy, but the basal membrane you can. Exactly. So yeah. microscopy tells you that exactly. Um, so the fun. Honestly, hemidesmosomes, they do a lot of things. They help you with the binding. So that means if you do get binding, then you're going to have a function. If you don't get binding, if you don't have the integration of the epithelium, you're not going to get epithelium. It's not going to be able to reproduce or regenerate. You need to have it anchored to something for it to function. Okay? Um, compartmentalization, polarity, barrier, um, formation. And cancer, if it penetrates through this basement membrane, then it's called cancerous. Otherwise, it's fine because it's usually benign. Because it's in the epithelial well, tissue. Um, so before it penetrates into the um, connective tissue, we call it carcinoma in situ. Yeah. Which called. is a benign tumor, benign it's, cancer. It's, yeah. It is cancer. Yeah. Carcinoma in situ is cancerous. But um, when, when it penetrates through, we call it squamous cell carcinoma. Okay? And that is a severe form. That's when, like, when it becomes carcinoma in situ, we should already be doing surgery. That makes sense? Because that's the point beyond severe dysplasia. It goes moderate, severe dysplasia, carcinoma in situ, and it penetrates through, becomes squamous cell carcinoma. Squamous cell carcinoma, it's, it's like terminal if we don't have it. Yeah. So just for your knowledge, and it helps with this example as well. Carcinoma, that's cancer of the epithelial. Adenocarcinoma, that's of like the, the adenoids, so your lymph organs, lymph nodes, your glands. So if you have if you have a cancer in the gland, because glands are usually separate from the epithelium or they'll have a duct coming off, if you have the cancer within the gland, that's called an adenocarcinoma. If you have a cancer within the epithelium outside, you have a carcinoma. Okay? Metaplasia, this is reversible. So like sometimes what will happen is your stomach will have get like reflux of acid and it will cause the cells above the normal like junction, like normal like uh, where the stomach and like the esophagus separate, it will cause the esophageal cells to convert to another type of cells. That's metaplasia. It's reversible if you take that stimulus away. So it's kind of like a protective feature of cells if you're becoming more strong. If you're like, well, I don't want to be a columnar anymore. I want to be more squamous because this acid is making me feel kind of shitty. I guess I don't know. It's just like it converts itself, but it's reversible if you take that signal away. Thanks. Okay. So, um, I don't know if Sage said this already, but it's 12 questions just on Dr. Lee's epithelium glands. And, okay, so expect the worst. Um, Aim for the best. Yeah, so I know we're going to go through the concepts, but you do need to know the details for the questions. I'm going to emphasize that, okay? You do need to know the details. Um, so glands, we're going to go over secreted substance signaling secretion, origin, and salivary gland. Okay, so secreted substances, the two main ones that you might want to focus on, mammary glands has all three, salivary glands has two. Okay, signaling, constitutive versus regulated. Which one's always on? Constitutive. Constitutive, cool. Regulated literally means it's being regulated. It might be on, it might be off, depending on the stimulus. Okay, autocrine, what does that mean? If you have two cells, is it talking to each other? No, it's just to itself, right? Paracrine. Neighboring. Neighboring cells, right? Endocrine is literally through the blood and um, through lymph. Okay? So, if you talk about exocrine glands, um, uh, then we can add exocrine glands versus endocrine glands. Endocrine, the main point about this is that when it's being formed, it's missing the duct. And that's why we call it the endocrine. Okay? Cool? The duct is missing. Okay? So... Let's go into exocrine glands. We have unicellular versus multicellular. Unicellular, only one you need to know, called the cells. Okay? Called the cells. And where did we find that? Which type of epithelium? Okay. And simple columnar. Cool. Okay. Uh, okay. So multicellular, we're going to go into those. When we say simple, it's going to have that um, one duct coming down. Versus when we have compound, it's going to have multiple ducts that are going into um, each gland. These are glandular cells and these, these are duct cells, right? Okay, so, um, sorry, secretory cells versus duct cells. So know that there's a difference between them, but the only one you really need to know, because she's not going to be like, which one is this, which one is that, because there's no pictures on the exam. So it's going to ask, like, which one is simple branch acid or which one's an example of that? It's a basic Okay? 
Uh, this is the one where she said that it was um, pear-shaped sacules. I don't know what that means. Um, yeah. So uh, these notes on the bottom, these are some of my notes in there. Uh, <laughs> Holocrine, merocrine, apocrine. Holocrine means you're actually, you want to lose the whole thing. So you're going to see it in sebaceous glands. You know, like acne, you know, you don't, you don't want acne. So I think of it as you want to lose the whole thing. So you're dispersing the whole cell. Easy? Okay. With merocrine, you're not actually losing anything. And so, you know, um, so what you're going to see is you, you're going to see it in acrine, which are specialized um, merocrine that you find the most commonly found sweat glands. Okay, they they have a special name. They're just called acrine glands. Okay, it's just another name for merocrine sweat glands. That's what it means. Um, exocytosis. So they're not actually losing any cellular material. They're just secreting. Okay. Well, yeah, they're secreting things. Okay. Apocrine. You're actually taking the tip off. So you find it in mammary glands. I put tip tip. That always. <laughs> okay, so cool. Your April a little too far. No? Okay. Does that help? You guys are going to remember it? Okay, good. It's pinched off. Pinched off. Okay. So, um, <laughs> epithelial glands. They got it. Okay, I'm just emphasizing it. Okay, so serous cells versus mucous cells. And then you have serous stimulants. On a conference exam, if you see a very eosinophilic uh, type of cell that's supposed to be um, a secretory cell, what is it? Very pinkish stained cell. Is it a mucus or is it a serous? Are you accurate? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> is it a serous or is it a mucus? You gotta know this for the conference. Yeah. I was yeah, curious. Sure. Sure. Sorry. <laughs> Which one's your cinephil? Which one's you know more pink? Oh. Serous. Serous. Yeah. Okay. The serous you, one. We'll, we'll have a lot of granules on yeah. the side. See, yeah. you might think serous. It's more fluid. It should be more pale. But forget it. It should. Be, it's the opposite. Okay. So. Maybe I just like put that idea well, into because, your head. Well, because the mucus but. itself has like, these vacuoles of like glycoproteins that don't get stained. Like they okay. don't get stained because yeah. there's just so many mucus in there. Especially now, right? So they're kind of globules of empty spaces. I bet you anything there's going to be a slide just on like the black cells. Okay? So you got to know the difference between the two. So see, it's intensely stained for serous cells versus it's not. It's clear. Okay? For mucus cells. Um, know that this is O link versus N linked. You do need to know that. Um, and O-link, you know, it's hydroxyl group with serine and green because those are the ones with hydroxyl groups. Um, I don't know how I remember that before, but M-O, Mo. Mo, no, yeah. Yeah, I went with Mo and I... Well, I just went with tin, but I was like S-M. Yeah, sure. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> and serous demilunes. Um, know that it's actually secreting serous fluid. Why? Because it's being coupled with mucus cells. So you'll notice that some of the cells, see... Right here, these are going to be your mucus cells, and you're going to have serous stimulants. So it's actually mixing it up. And this is supposed to be a mixed blood. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Is that underneath the mucus always? Underneath the mucus? Cell? Yeah, it's yeah, going to be on the like periphery of the mucus cells. Yeah, exactly. Because that's we'll serious, like, fluidy, so it kind of blocks yeah. the mucus away. So if you see a slide with it, they might trick you like that. It's, you know, if you, I'm not sure if he's going to mark it wrong, but instead of putting serious cells, you might have to put serous stimulants. Does that make sense? Because you see it beside a mucus cell. Yeah, you see okay. mucus cell and serous cell together, put serous yeah. stimulants. Yeah, if they're together, if you see like a very lightly clear and a very stained um, cell together, then it's going to be serious stimulants for the stained one. Cool? Easy? Okay. There it is. Okay, gland cells. Intercalated versus um, striated. They're going to both function the same way. I I know some texts will give you different uh, reasons behind it, but um, she basically simplified it for us, and she said that they're both doing the same thing. So just know that they're both doing the same thing. Immunoglobulin A, main point. Like I said, you got to know the details for her. Um, electrolytes, and they're basically modifying it. So they're going to be absorbing and secreting electrolytes. They're going to change that up, okay? She used the word low, flat, it just means it's kind of squished. It's still cuboidal, okay? Uh, versus these guys, it's columnar for striated. Got it? My epithelial cells, what they're doing is they're squeezing the glands, and they're being innervated by uh, autonomics to do exactly that, okay? And we call them basket cells. Remember how she put clock base and whatnot, and she changed the slides? I would know this word as well, basket cells, just in case it shows up. 
Cockfish is not related to this. Yeah. No, that, I'm just that, saying that's, that's an cell. example. Okay. Got it? Okay. Um, yeah, I can do this. Okay, connective tissue proper. We can divide it into uh, several different types. Um, this is going to be in, uh, you know, uh, a reference for your conference as well. So we know this now. Um, so there's two types of um, embryonic tissue. It's going to be mesenchymal and mucus, right? Mesenchymal, you literally see mesenchymal cells, but how you're going to be able to tell, um, you're still going to see some vascularization because it's still embryonic and needs that. And you're going to see reticular fibers that are very lightly kind of stained, but you can see the fibers still that are going through. Okay. Um, know that they're pale nuclei centrally located because she likes to ask these long questions, like long answers that have like one word difference. Does the shift mention about the stages of reticular plasma Right, mesenchymal cells don't have. Yeah. But I thought we still find reticular fibers. No, he said no. like just. No, the doctor found it under a textbook, but the doctor knows she was right. We don't think oh, so. Okay. We forget about the fibers. <laughs> that's great. Okay. Professor, yeah. Professor, yeah. So he said you won't have that question. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, that solves the problem. Also, can't you, like, I remember you were able to see the fibers and mark it stained. Stained by silver. Yeah. 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 You got it. Silver. Like, you can't point anywhere. Exactly. Because this Lee is stained. Lee was insane. actually pointing to silver. He just said you just said you would see a lot. Like that's that. What you see there is extended cytoplasm of the cell. You don't see fibers. The processes. You don't see fibers. Okay. Because they're not fibers. Okay. So, um, one of the main points, the difference between mesenchymal and mucus, let's use description, gel-like versus jelly-like. Okay. <laughs> know that. Gel-like for mesenchymal, jelly-like for mucus. Okay. Got it? Jelly-like. Okay. So, uh, those are the main ones. We find them in the pulp, although we say that it's embryonic. Okay. For mesenchymal. Know okay. that. Yeah. So three things you should know. They're pale nuclei centrally um, located, gel-like. They're found in adults as well. Okay. Mucus. Um, you see fibroblasts here. Most of the latter ones, you're all, all you're going to see is like fibroblasts plus other cells, if you do see them. Okay. Because fibroblasts are making all these fibers. Type 1 and 3 collagen. You do need to know that. Jelly-like, like I just said. And Wharton's jelly is only found in umbilical cord and so uh, subdermal connective tissue of embryo. So when you compare the two, you should be able to tell the difference. Okay, um, you're gonna see fibroblasts instead of mesenchymal cells. They're gonna be centrally located and they're kind of elongated, star shaped. We call it star shaped. Okay, um, this is gonna be a little bit more messy for you, uh, fibroblasts. But you don't see other types of cells here, and that's how you're gonna be able to differentiate between, like, let's say, areolar tissue or and whatnot. Okay, and you can the the way you're going to be able to tell uh, with, um, let's say, what, what might be a confusing one versus mucus? Dense irregular. Dense irregular. Dense irregular. Yeah. Yeah. But dense irregular, you're going to see a lot it's of... It's going to be darker. Yeah. It's going to be pinker. Too. Okay. Because you have cool. less fibers in your skin. Okay. So, um, areolar, it's a mess, but you see everything. That's what you need to know. You see all types of fibers. You see all types of cells. Done? Okay. Um, dense, regular versus irregular. You do need to specify if it's collagenous or elastic for the conference exam. Got it? Yeah. Okay. Also, he all. Oh, sorry. Yeah, for dense um, connective tissue, regular and irregular, you do need to step specify that it's elastic or collagenous. Does this dense regular elastic? Well, they yeah, do have both, but for, yeah. And as well as for for loose connective you gotta, tissue, you got to say areolar or you got to say loose collagenous. Yeah, I guess what yeah. You're saying. yeah. You have to specify areolar. Just say areolar. Yeah. Just say. Just, yeah. Areolar is the safer way. Yeah, so there's just okay. two categories, loose and dense. Loose only really has areolar. You're done. And then dense has a regular, irregular, and the regular one has your elastic and your collagenous, and that's it. So yes. you just categorize it like that, it's just easier to get. Okay, so I know some of you guys might be confused with um, the location, because you're thinking elastic, that must be in ligaments and tendons. But the dense, regular, collagenous, it's actually in tendon uh, ligaments and aponeurosis. Okay, so tendon ligaments are under collagenous. Got that? You need to understand that. Um, elastic, you're going to find them in. This was one of the questions. <laughs> aorta, I think we got the point back in this. But aorta, ligamentum flava, and penis. Cool? The important part is if we all agree to get it wrong, then we get the point back. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's the point of this conference, yeah. just to agree that you should have got all it? these questions. Okay. <laughs>
So what's the function? What's the difference between regular versus irregular? Irregular is actually resisting forces from all, all um, directions, okay? Right. Versus regular is resisting force from one direction. One direction? Cool. Okay. No, I said it right. Irregular. Irregular is all directions. Yeah. Regular is one. Okay. So that's what we're going to see. And that's why you see uh, these guys um, staying with orsine, elastic fibers orsine versus reticular fibers silver. If you see anything black, really black like this, it's mostly elastic fibers. Okay, that's usually the only real way to um, stain elastic fibers and see them. Okay, um, so density regular CT, like I said, function and resist force from all directions, and you're gonna see it in capsules, you're gonna see it in sheets, you're gonna see it in lymphatic organs. So you see this a lot um, in different places. Um, versus discrete places, you're gonna see more of the dense regular connective uh, connective tissue. Okay. So, and like it looks different than the mucus because it has way less cells. You can see it's way more collagen. Yeah, exactly. So all these dense tissue, it's, a lot of it's going to be fine. Yeah, a lot of it's right. Fine. A lot of it is fine. Okay. Um. So I, you'll notice that when you compare this with Dr. Lee's mm -hmm. slides, we've actually um, organized it into cells, fibers, ground substance, location, and function for all of them. Okay. So, so it's going to make it a lot easier for you to just get the concepts. So that's why we sent out the slides, right? Okay, reticular tissue. Main point, you find what types of fibers? Reticular fibers. Sorry. Reticular fibers. Cool? Uh, it's going to be a lot of branching. It's going to be, that's why we call it mesh-like network. Um, it's dark as well. Uh, but the main point of the look, uh, the main point is that you need to know that the location is in the stroma. Stroma is the supporting structure of these organs. Okay? Know that. Um, function, it's, it's kind of like the soft tissue underneath. Okay. And um, it's going to be removing microbes. I don't know if that's important. But yeah. um, with these ones, you know that it's reticular tissue. I always think of like rats, they're dirty, so we need our immune system. So I always think like it's related to immune, like lymphatic lymph organs. And um, I think they're going like to walk microbes. around with just like rats and, and it's all. Cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know. Does, do these help yeah, at all? Sure. Okay. So. Adipose tissue, you know that there's two kinds, unilocular versus multilocular. Which one's brown, which one's white? No, no. Multi is brown, right? So if you're more think athletic... Of multi, think of multigrain, like multigrain whole Yeah, okay, that's, that's really the cool. That's easiest one yeah. I do. Multigrain first, but just easiest. Fit people have more percentage of what? Brown. Multi. Brown, right? Good. Both ends. Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, that works too. Okay, <laughs> um, so you're going to find unilocular uh, white fats in here. Where else would you find fat cells, actually? Okay. We learned it in blood. Exactly, yeah, bone marrow as well, right? Okay, so there it is. Um, it's for energy, you guys already know that. You guys should be able to compare all of these guys, okay? You guys need to be able to compare fixed versus transient, which cells are fixed, which one's transient. And there's actually one cell that's both. You guys know which one cell that is? Huh? One cell that is both fixed and transient. Oh, that's uh, a mass. So mass, macrophage, 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 okay. Yeah. Macrophage, okay. Um, and know that fixed ones, they're gonna be your hematopoietic line and transient. You're gonna see that with the um, lymphoid line and and uh, E cell, T cell. No, fixed is fixed. Be, no. Right? Fixed is your other one. Transient is your other one. Okay. Fixed. Fixed is your. Okay. Anyways, <laughs> sorry. If you look at the graph, you should be able to see it. I'm just blanking out right now. But fibroblast versus fibrocyte. Which one has more organelles? Which one's more active? Fibroblast. Perfect. So which one would you see more dense nucleus, actually? Why? What are you actually seeing? What's dense? Chromatin. What kind of chromatin is it? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Right? Perfect. Okay. Um, we define the shapes by polyhedral versus polygonal. Well, three, 3D versus 2D because you need to lock like a big globule, so yeah. it's 3D versus like multi-lockage like flat earth. Okay. That's that's <laughs> in the detail too, Dr. Lee. Okay. Know that. Uh, parasite, it's angiogenic because it's able to divide. Okay. It's able to differentiate. Okay. Um, it forms the blood brain barrier and it actually shares a basal membrane. Okay, basement membrane. With the um with the uh, endothelial cells. Got it? Mesh cells. IgE medi uh, mediated, 
metachromatic brightness. Why is it metachromatic? What does metachromatic mean? Uh, changes color to blue and nice. Blue and blue. Purple. Why? Why is it changing color? Because it's yeah, yeah, exactly it's sulfur. What actually has sulfur? Stuff that needs sulfur. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> um, you're gonna find sulfur in gags, right? So those things. Okay. Um, for mast cells, you're gonna have a list of all those things that it's actually secreting. You do need to know them. You do need to know them. Just, okay. just know histamine is like the first one. Leukotrienes, all those. Okay. Um, know what's, which one's primary versus secondary. When you go through the slides, you can see that. Uh, macrophage, it's an antigen presenting cell. It's a phagocyte, fixed and wandering. We talked about that already. Know these words, juxtanuclear Golgi, clock face, and antibodies, plasma cells. Okay. Don't get this mixed up with mast cells. I know that some people were confused with mast cell versus plasma cell. They were like, well, this one's, this one's inflammatory, and is this one inflammatory? No, plasma cells are releasing. We already know some different lineages, right? Because we know mast cells came from CAP gem, three granulocytes, and the plasma cells came from CAP mod. I think they threw that out right Okay, after got it. Place. Okay, yeah. so different lineages. Yeah. Is that all fixed or? It's, uh, it's fixed. Yeah. Actually, that's where I wish that. Yeah, they have been. Again? Oh my gosh. What are we going with it? I, I don't know. Hematopoietic stem cells, I said most of you are wandering, right? So I'm going with it. He said you won't put this question. You won't put it? Okay, sorry. Don't, don't worry about it again. Just no macrophages are both fixed and wandering. Okay. Um, collagen, we're going to talk about how it's being you know, synthesized later, but um, know that you have hydroxyproline. What is the disorder associated with hydroxyproline? You guys know? When you have a vitamin deficiency? Mm -hmm. Yeah, scurvy, right? Vitamin what? C. Great. Okay, so um, there's gap regions, there's overlap. Which one stays darker? Gap. Oh, gap. Overlap. Gap. Gap. It's gap. Okay, gap. Think about it in the sense that you have more space to stain things. So it stays darker. Okay? Know it that way. Cool? Okay, so reticular fibers. Uh, type 3 collagen. You're going to have a list of all the types of collagen uh, with uh, Dr. Craig's lecture and whatnot, so don't worry about it. Um, when you get to it, you'll see it. Okay, we talked about silver staining, that's the most important thing. Done. Elastic fibers. If we don't have fibrillin, then we get Norfan syndrome. You do need to know that one. Cool? Because elastic fibers have two components they have the elastin and the fibrillin component on the outside. So they're stretching. Okay. okay. Um, ground substance, you're going to find gags, proteoglycans, and multi-adhesive glycans. What is an example of a multi-adhesive glycan? The one that seems to integrate things. Yeah. Yeah. Fibronectin. Okay. Cool. Fibronectin, I think she meant, does she mention that it has three domains? I think she yeah, she yep. does. Yeah, she does. Okay, so know those three domains. She mentions in what, like, which domain is made up of, and she mentions like the three domains. Yeah, so know those domains. Okay. Uh, uh, this is honestly this stuff is like I know it seems complicated now, but it's one what? of those things that if you kind of like just understand that there's fiber and then oh, your function is obviously to adhere to two two and things at least the integrins and the collagen. You know already two yeah, sides. <laughs> one is integrin binding, one's collagen. What's the answer? <laughs> the other one's phosphorus. Yeah, or gag binding. Cell. Cell binding, gag binding. Oh. Gag binding. Okay, I know she was confused with this. Really easy. Okay. <laughs> Hydrostatic pressure literally is like blood pressure. Okay, it's pretty much the same thing. So, do you have more hydrostatic pressure in your arteries or your veins? Arteries. Perfect. Okay. And your osmotic pressure, um, it's inversely proportional. Um, I learned it a different way, but um, we we know that it's inversely proportional because osmotic pressure is moving fluid from where to where. Outside the insulin. Right. Yes. And it depends on the solids. It's how much solids you have inside. Right? So you're lose, as you're losing fluid, your concentration of your solutes are increasing, and therefore your fluid is wanting to move from your connective tissue into the blood. And that's what we call the osmotic pressure. Does that make sense? Yeah? Easy? Okay. Just, just think hydrostatic blood pressure, and then you can reverse it for osmotic. Okay? Okay. All these, these disorders, you can go through them. Uh, they're pretty simple. Cellulitis, infection, heloid, it's a lot of scar tissue broken up. Um, scurvy, 
We talked about that already. These are the four ones that you need to know. We already talked about epidermal lysis bullosa last year. Um, so you already know that. Um, and ehlers danlos you can commonly get that mixed up with um, children being abused because we have weak blood vessels and, and tissue. So you, it's going to look like you have a lot of, I mean, you do have a lot of bruises and whatnot. Um, and you're also going to get flexible joints and things like that. Okay. Murfan syndrome, we already talked about it. Osteogenesis imperfecta, it's when you can't form bone quite well. Um, these are the autoimmune. I would know them by their categories and know the causes. Okay. Uh, irritation fibroma, it's not a big deal. You can bite on your tongue a couple times and you can actually have these things. This is a pretty big deal, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but those ones, I mean, it's not bad, okay? Fibroma is something that you're, you're going to accumulate over years. Okay, mm -hmm. peripheral ossifying fibroma. Um, this bone. is with the bone ossifying. Okay, okay. giant cell granuloma. Uh, I guess you can see it under slides, but... Um, these ones just know that they're multinucleated. Okay. Desmoplastic fibroma. So this one, the main point is that you do need a mandibular resection. Okay, and they recur quite high, twenty five percent is pretty high. As a connective tissue, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Biochemistry. All right. Uh, so this is pretty straightforward. Um, a lot of this is just basic. It's just basically memorization. Um, so as far as collagen goes, everyone, we all know that collagen is made of um, alpha chains, the three of them come together, um, and that each alpha chain is comes together in a right-handed helix, and then the three alpha, cha three alpha chains come together in a left-handed helix, and that's, that's probably the big thing we get from this. As well as the formula here, uh, glycine, X is usually proline, and Y is usually hydroxyproline. Not obviously, it's not always, but that's the general scheme of it. Um, and each, we'll go into it, but each of these ha conveys a certain function to the collagen. Um, so these, here's a chart of, these are all the ones that we need to know for the quiz. I assume we need to know them for the final, uh, or for the midterm. Um, so I don't need to go, I'm not going to go through it all, but they're here for you to look at. These, yeah, like I said, these are the ones of that huge list they give us. These are the ones that we need to know. Um, again, these uh, facet forming ones are ones that are, that have, it's collagen that's interrupted by like a uh, protein or like fi fiber. Protein nectin. interrupted by collagen sequences. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a better way to put it. Yeah, um, yeah, that's I I know on the quiz I think collagen ten was one of the questions on there yeah. for that. It's found in hydrogen cartilage. Okay, so this is important to understand the difference between telopeptides and propeptides. So your propeptides are found on the ends here, okay, and those are what are preventing the collagen from forming a triple helix with inside the, like inside the cell. You don't want it to form inside the cell because the cell is going to die if a whole bunch of collagen start forming inside of it. So what's going to happen is these are going to get cleaved off extracellularly, and then this col this right here, the collagen, is going to then form up into the collagen fiber outside the cell. That's the way you want it. Telopeptides are just these little bits on the end here that don't form as part of the alpha helix. And so you can measure that in, like, can you measure it in serum or serum. yeah, you can you can, and yeah in urine. So you can tell that that gives you an indication of the collagen turnover rate. So if you have a lot of that, then you know you're breaking down a lot of collagen. Um, yeah, so definitely know the difference between propeptide, telopeptide. Um, glycine. Yeah, the uh, yeah. So glycine because glycine you know is a really small amino acid that lets you pack pack um, pack it really tightly together. We know pr proline is um, preventing it from its returning, right? It's it gives that structure the, 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 the it, turn. It oh, it's it's what yeah, sorry, it's what causes the turn. Yeah, and then hydroxyproline um, is responsible for intra-chain bonding, so it's just conveying more strength basically. Um, we get the banded appearance because of the quartered stagger array. We know so that's all, we can know. That's all we have no to know. There's no quartered stagger array because they have an overlapping gap. Yeah, and the stain goes in the gap region, so that's darker stain in the gap region. Um, synthesized in the rough ER and in the Golgi, like I said, um, it only becomes the the three alpha chains only come together once it's outside the cell, once those propeptides get cleaved off. And well, the three no. alpha chains. Well, what do you mean? What do you, what sorry, do you, what do you yeah. Mean, like the, the, 
the collagen. Sorry, yeah, the collagen. Sorry, the collagen itself. My bad. The collagen itself actually in that court becomes in that quartered stagger array outside the cell. The three alpha chains will only come together once they've had their um, post translational modifications. So once you have all your prolines become hydroxyprolines and stuff like that, then it'll become it'll fold up together. Yeah. mRNA gets translated right into the ER. The ER now has alpha chains inside of it, individual ones. They'll get recognized each other by the, the end terminal sequence. And then once the post translation modification of the molecule goes next, they'll wrap around each other and make the one collagen molecule. But remember, it has the propeptides on it still, so it can't form together. But once they're excreted, the propeptides get cut off, and now it can form a collagen fiber. Yeah. Cool. Yep. Second? Okay, that was good. Okay. Was okay. So now there's two enzymes we got to know. Uh, Prolyl hydroxylase is the first one. This is what uh, is converting um, proline to hydroxyproline. And you need to know the requirements. So vitamin C, this is how you get, this is what um, scurvy is going to be affecting. So this is when, so you're not going to have enough vitamin C, so this this uh, enzyme will be able to function. Uh, and like it, I've already said this, it's going to happen prior to the formation. Um, yeah, know the requirements for prolyl hydroxylase. Now lysyl hydroxylase is giving you hydroxylysine. Uh, this one's responsible for extracellular um, collagen, uh, collagen crosslinks. Um, again, now again, you need to know that <coughs> this requires copper. If you don't, if, and if your body can't extract enough copper from the food you eat, then you have what's called Menke's disease down here. And this is also inhibited by inhibited by beta amino propionitrile. So like, that's found in sweet peas. If you podcast this or went to this lecture, we gave some like really like messed up descriptions of like experiments they did with like bunnies and watched their ears droop and weird crap like that. <laughs> Uh, okay, so these two, like, everyone's cool with those? That's all good? Okay, um, so elastin, now he's, he talked about this for a bit. Uh, the main difference between elastin and, col or elastin and collagen is that uh, elastin has a lot more hydrophobic proteins, which are very important for its function. I'll get to that in a sec. And it has desmazine, which is like a, uh, pretty sure it was, he said it was a derivative of uh, lysine? Is that Yes. Yeah, yeah. desmazine is a... Okay. So, and he described this really good way. So basically, looking at Desmond, you have all these hydrophobic amino acids around the uh, around the periphery here, right? So if you were to grab this and stretch it out of a liquid, right? As soon as you let go, all of these all of these um, hydrophobic amino acids are going to want to get cr get right back up together because you just increase their surface area by pulling it out. So as soon as you let go, it's going to spring back and get, crumple up again to, you know, like protect those hydrophobic amino acids. So that the hydrophobic amino acids are really what conveys that elasticity to these things. Uh, yeah, here's the chart. He gave the exact same one, uh, just the differences between them. Hydroxyproline is still found in both of them, and he mentioned that as far as, far as the turnover for elastin, the elastins that you were born with, you still can have some of them. There's turnover very very slow. Uh, fibronectin we just talked about. Um, Haptaxis, I think, does he even say say this? Yeah, yeah Haptaxis is basically just fibronectin okay, will, uh, will, will bind to collagen where there's damage and stuff. And so that means that anything that's passing through that can fix that damage, like neutrophils or like help with the tissue damage, will bind to the fibronectin sticking out and slow it down, slow the neutrophil down, and so it can like go into the tissue and there it can do its job and stuff. Yeah. So that's kind of like the way it's been haptotaxis. Taxis just meaning like signaling to the commons and half the way. He he also so he went over to the, the uh, there's type there's repeats within the fiber uh, fibronectin structure and there's like type one type two and type three the important one is type three repeats because type three repeats are where you have this RGD sequence and that is where integrins are going to bind and that's really important for the function of fibronectin um, in terms of yeah like Sage just said like hepatotaxis um, turnover rate I would just know that it's fastest in your PDL which is important to us obviously. Um, yeah, okay, so degradation of collagen, so matrix metallo, uh, metalloproteases are going to be doing this, MMPs. Um, there's invertebrates, ours, the ones that we have are going to digest collagen at the hinge region, which kind of di divides into like a three-quarter length and a quarter length, kind of divides into a weird area. Um, bacterial ones are going to cut every triplet at the end, at the before every glycine? Before every glycine. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so it's going to cut every triplet. I mean, I don't know if that'll be a question on that or not. It's good to know. So we know there's a lot of we know there's a lot of different kinds. They all require zinc, um, and they require zinc and calcium for their conformational stability. 
So I think it's a cofactor company. Yeah. But they require calcium and zinc to work. Yeah. So. Yeah. I get. Yeah. It's kind of weird. <laughs> keep it to keep the yeah, the it active site stable. Like, it, it will yeah. work, but it won't work as well without the calcium. Yeah. So again, we broke it down here. These are just the ones that we need to know. Fourteen was on the quiz. Uh, it's membrane. It's bound in the membrane. Um, Twenty is important because it's bound in teeth. Uh, I know uh, two or no, one of these is also on the quiz too about. Um, it was two. Was it, yeah, it was two. Yeah, two deals with. So collagenases are going to initially break down the collagen, and then once it breaks it down, it's it's going to form a gelatinous mass, and so that's where gelatinases are going to come in and break it down further after that. So they're already when they say already de denatured. Yeah, when they say yeah. denatured collagen, they so need the, the gelatinous. That's what that that's exactly. Yeah, that was that that was the tricky part. Don't worry, I thought for that. Yeah. Damn yeah. this. <laughs> <laughs> so Mr. Stimulating over there. now there's so there's two ways that MMPs can be uh, inhibited. There's uh, TIMPs, which can which will inhibit it locally, and then there's alpha macroglobins, which will inhibit it in your bloodstream. Systematic. Yeah. That's all we need. Systematic. Yeah, and that's it. Um, for the clinical applications, he just said MMP8 has a uh, what did he say? Has a uh, higher affinity for it? No, MMP8 has a lower affinity for it. And so if you administer tetracycline, or I guess you said like doxycycline, I guess or something, like the same thing, but um, if you administer that, it's going to compete with zinc, it's going to bind some of the zinc, and so then MMP8s aren't going to have that zinc available, so they're not going to function, so you get less inflammation. Um, yeah, and that's, yeah, that's an important concept to understand, too. So do you want me to do, do you want Cartilage, not much to do in cartilage. There's hyaline, elastic, and fibrocartilage. <laughs> um, hyaline, found in lung bones, costal cartilages, elastic, epiglottis, external ear, fibro, TMG, if you look synthesis. This, examples are all here. Uh, the important thing is that it does not have very good limits, so it's not very defined where it ends and where it starts. On the other hand, these two both have a pericardium. Okay. Type 2 collagen, that's going to be hyaline cartilage. Type 2? Hyaline cartilage. Remember, type 1 collagen is the actual. They call type 1 collagen collagen. They call type 3 reticular. And then type 2 is for the hyaline cartilage. Even though they're all collagens, okay? Just keep that in mind. Uh, in hyaline cartilage, you'll find these cells. They're called chondrocytes. Remember, that's because they make the cartilage. Chondrocytes, and they're going to be, uh, well, they're going to start as chondroblasts, make all, the fi make all the fibers, make the type 2 collagen, and they're going to get trapped inside their own matrix. At that point, they become chondrocytes, kind of inactive. And the chondrocytes are going to be in the space called a lacuna. Okay, so the spaces are called lacuna. And under micro under microscope, you see the white spaces because the cells usually fall out or they or they shrink up. And the shrinking up, that's why you see all light through there. But normally there'd be cells inside there. There's an empty space. Uh, outside of the lacuna, you have the pericellular capsule. Uh, the cells themselves, when there's two of them or three or two of them in the divide, they're called an isogenous group. Um, and the territorial matrix is the space. Uh, right around the pericellular capsule, and the interterritorial matrix is this area that's away from the, the like the territorial. So territorial will surround each pericellular capsule, which will have the chondrocytes inside of it, and the territorial matrix usually stains darker, okay? And the interterritorial will stain lighter and paler. You guys don't lie. Because it's self clear. Okay. Why? Okay, like you guys need to know the contents of territorial matrix and interterritorial. Yeah, so territorial will have more. Does it have more collagen or less collagen? More. Less collagen. That's why you get the, the darker state. So think about it this way. It's so a tighter space, so there would be less fibers. Exactly. So a tighter space gives you less collagen. Therefore, whenever you see collagen, you get the light pink stain. Mm -hmm. Whenever you hear less collagen, more cellular stuff, more gag stuff, more ground substance, then you'll get a <coughs> darker stain. Because the ground substance was giving you that kind of like darker color. And then like on the other hand, you have the interterritorial space that's where a lot of collagen is, less cells, less gags, you'll have the lighter stain. Is that clear? Elastic cartilage, very similar, very similar. Uh, uh, elastic cartilage is found in like the, the ear kind of things, like that's elastic right there. Um, gives the bendability, I guess, if you want to call it that, and very similar to hyaline. It's more similar to hyaline than fibrocartilage, okay? So just keep that in mind. And hyaline cartilage, you can almost think of it as a transition between like your your tendon, like your tendon, I guess, that'd be the, and the, and the bone of that kind of like cartilage, okay? So it's going from a bone to a tendon, it's like that kind of transition. So fibrocartilage has areas that look like dense regular, but they're not because they have chondrocytes. So you can see the chondrocytes inside of it. They're kind of like in sequence usually. So if you see the contents like these sequences, then usually you know you're in fibrocartilage. Okay, 
and they're very light skin because the car the, the, the fibers aren't very thick. And they're tra oh, so fibro cartilage is the transitional tissue between the hyaline and the cartilage and the tendon. So it's kind of between the two. And there's no perichondrium. Remember, there's no limits to fibro cartilage. So you won't see a like nice border on the edges. You don't know where it kind of starts or where it kind of ends. It kind of transitions between the two. Okay, hyaline perichondrium, elastic perichondrium, fibro no perichondrium. Hyaline cartilage, uh, so joints, hyaline cartilage will cover the articular surface. The only articular disc we know that's not made of hyaline cartilage is the TMJ, the fibrocartilage. Right? That's the only exception. But other than that, most bones will have hyaline cartilage to the articular surface. And why is that? Because hyaline cartilage has a lot of gags. It will recruit a lot of water because gags are very charged. You will get a lot of water going into it, and the water gives you that cushioning. When you like have two bones together, you want to have that cushioning in between, the water in between to kind of give you that smooth rotation between bones. So hyaline cartilage is good for that. Perfect. Cartilage growth. So there's two types of growth, appositional and interstitial. Appositional, girth, interstitial, length. Girth, because the chondrocytes on our chondroblasts in the perichondrium are dividing and, mito and going through mitosis. So that perichondrium is getting further and further away from the middle. So kind of picture like the hyaline cartilage growing this way. Versus when the chondrocytes in the middle of the lacunae, they divide and they like become longer, it will cause the interstitial growth for the hyaline cartilage to grow this way. So if you can picture a baby's arm, it's hyaline cartilage, like the, like the bone right here is just hyaline cartilage like this. So if you have interstitial growth, that bone, that cartilage is getting longer this way. If you have appositional, it's getting thicker this way. Okay. Bone, bone objectives, yeah, okay. So bone has got three, uh, four lamellar systems. So there's the outer circumferential, Intercircumferential, osteans, and interstitial. What do I mean by lamellar? Basically, just the way you divide the collagen. You can see the different like layers of collagen. Um, periosteum is making the outside. So whenever you think peri, like in bone, and if you think peri in chondrocytes, it's like the outer like definition of that cartilage or the bone. Okay. So it's easier to understand how bone came to be if you understand how cartilage becomes a bone. Okay. So cartilage normally has a perichondrium on the outside, right? That perichondrium, when it's ready to become into a bone, will get converted to the periosteum. So that's what happened. And the inside is where all of this stuff is happening. So like the, the endosteum, the lamellae, all that stuff that's inside. Um, osteum is how we divide like one herversion canal system. So when you have blood vessels, around each blood vessel you have an osteon. And that osteon is just a division for like how we divide the lamella as well. Okay. Basic unit of a compact bone. So, I don't know why we didn't put the, the bone. Okay. bone structures. No, there's the one for that's bone. Okay, let's go with let's go with this. So there's types of bones. There's primary bone, which is also known as immature woven spongy bone. This is the bone that's going to be formed initially. So when you have a hyaline cartilage or like a long bone that's ready to become into a bone, you'll get a bone collar forming around the, the middle part of it. This will cut off all the diffusion to the cartilage because we know cartilage is two things: it's avascular and a neuronal. Doesn't have neural, doesn't have nerves, doesn't have vascularization. So it means the only blood supply and only nervous tissue supply it has is coming from diffusion. Or well, nerve supply doesn't really come from diffusion, but the vascularization comes from diffusion. So if you make a bone call around the middle, the chondrocytes in the middle are not getting a supply anymore. They're gonna start freaking out. <laughs> so what's gonna happen is basically a blood vessel is then gonna pierce through the periosteum because the bone collar loves the periosteum. So the, it's gonna pierce through the bone collar. It's called the periosteal buff. With the blood vessel, what's coming is the osteoblasts, the osteoclasts, as well as some osteocytes and other stuff. And this, what they're going to do is the osteoclasts are going to start cleaning up the mess that the cartilage is going to leave behind. And they're going to start replacing cartilage because the osteoblasts, now they have their own blood vessels, they all have their own blood supply, they're going to win in mitosis in comparison to the osteo, in comparison to the chondrocytes. So chondrocytes, will happen is they'll sharp, start shifting this way. They'll start growing this way because that's the only place left for them to go. On the other, because the bone collar's number is around the middle, there's still supply up here. So as they start shifting this way, the osteoblasts are going to keep like killing the ones in the middle and keep growing this way. And so as they grow a bit this way, they kind of create the matrix for the new bone. And once the matrix is established, the calcium that's flowing through your blood, because remember, calcium is always like there's a there's an amount of calcium in extracellular fluid, there's an amount of calcium in your serum, that's going to be able to deposit in that new matrix that the bone that the osteoblasts have laid down. Okay. So that's, that's your primary immature bone, because now you have a lot of like different mess up things, you have a lot of osteoblasts, you have a lot of like growth. That's your primary bone. It's kind of soft, it's not as very calcified. Okay? So what's gonna happen is your osteoclast will have to eat that calcium back up and kind of make it into a nice 
compact bone that's going to be your secondary mature uh, second sorry it really has to make, make it to a nice bone, which is going to become your secondary mature trabeculated bone. And then when they do it more and make their osteons and stuff, they get compact bone on the outside and most likely trabeculated bone in the middle. That's where your bone mass is going to be found. Yeah, yes. I was wondering about that. Like, when you make compact bone, you're not making it from secondary. When you're making you make compact bone. from primary, right? Like, I think, I think what happens is like actually the, the mature bone is there, so you get the secondary mature bone, and then the compact bone forms on the outside of that. So like you actually keep like eating things away. That's where you get the interstitial lamellas, lamellas or whatever. Those are leftover like eaten stuff that hasn't become into an osteon. So I think it's just like a transition. So like you start off with a primary, you go to secondary, and then you go to compact on the outside, right? Yeah. And that's the way it is. It's just it just makes more sense because your primary would be like the kind of like rough, like it's like matrix is here. You kind of put the calcium calcium in. That's not organized the way it needs to be. Osteoclasts come back and they get nice trabeculated things, and then eventually they'll Keep eating away things and making it more compact, more dense, where pressure is applied, and you'll get a compact bone. Okay? So let's go back. So some of the things you'll see in bones is that the osteum will be around a Herbergian canal. This is a Herbergian canal, so you can see blood vessels. This will be uh, blood vessels, veins, as well as some lymph stuff. And around each one, you'll have these lamellae. And the lamellae are basically just a way to organize, uh, like the more collagen. What happens is one, one layer of collagen will be this way, and the next layer of collagen will be this way. And the next one will be this way. So that's why you, when you take the bone out, you can see the osteons and you peel them back. You can see different orientations of collagens. So that's how they were laid down in the matrix. And that's why we split them. So each osteon can have 4 to 20 in the middle. Okay? And what are these cells in between? These are your osteocytes. Now these are cells that are living, so they still need supply. So how do they get the blood supply? Because there's a Herbergian canal in the middle. Unfortunately, the Diffusion is not going to be enough just for, like, diffusion is going to be enough because it's just a bone. So you have these, like, processes that are coming off the osteocytes called canalicula, which reach into the kind of, like, give you that, like, proximity to the Herbergian canal. And they're all connected to each other. So as you get further and further out, obviously it gets harder and harder to get diffusion out there. That's why you have a limited amount of lamellas that you can have. So the osteocytes have canaliculi, which allow diffusion to get through, to get the nutrients in. And obviously you can tell... The further out you are from the Herbergian canal, is that newer or older bone? Older. older bone. So older bone goes out here, and newer bone is near the center. And what happens to the Herbergian canal? Is it bigger or smaller in a new bone? It's bigger. It's bigger. Initially it's bigger, but as you keep building more and more, it will eventually get smaller and smaller. Right? Makes sense. Cement lines. Cement lines, when you start eating bone away to make these osteons, to make these compact bones, you, you will have a way to do it. Either you can do like a stop and go, stop and go. That's going to give you the rest or rest, rest start lines or whatever that they're called. But if you use like stop and start rest lines, those are your rest cement lines. But if you remodel, so like let's say you build something, but you take it away and then you build somewhere else, that's a reversal. So you basically had formation, but then you had distortion. So these are just the way to like see lines in here. You see a cement line here, cement line here. He doesn't care which one's which. He just wants to know cement lines can be two types, rest and reverse. So yeah, like on the comp exam, if they had an error pointing that, you just need to say cement, cement. line. You wouldn't need to specify which one. Okay. Uh, and Volksmann canals are Herbergian canals, but the horizontal ones. These are the ones that don't have osteons around them because they're the ones connecting the Herbergian canals together. And also connecting Herbergian canals to the outside, outside of the bone, as well as connecting the Herbergian canals to the inside, which is the end osteon. Good. And remember, her version system, this osteon system, this is compact bone. What's inside is trabeculated. Remember? Okay, so trabeculated came, like trabeculated was the whole thing, but as it became further and further out, there's osteons until it got the compact inside. Bone matrix, inorganic matrix, um, that's 65% of the bone. That's calcium phosphate. That's what it is. Uh, and hydroxy um, ions. Organic matrix, that's your type 1, mostly. Remember, that's your collagen and type 5 collagen. So you just have to know that, and there's also non-collagenous proteins, and they're much, much larger. Than, oh, the collagen is much larger than non-collagenous proteins. That makes sense. But um, you just have to understand that the organic matrix is 35% of the bone, but a lot, a major part of that bone is actually going to be the inorganic part, just like your teeth, which gives it that strength, which gives that like that ability to take the pressure off. Of course, bone attachment molecules. Jesus Christ. Okay, so non-collagenous proteins. These are the ones we mentioned here. So these are the ones we have to check. No, they don't. So there's uh there's four types there's fibronectin, thrombospondin, osteopontin, bone xyloprotein. These were uh these were mentioned if you remember from biochemistry. Same thing. They all bind calcium. These just know they bind calcium and they're used for bone attachment. That's all you have to know. You don't have to know very many details. Just know they bind calcium for those three. 
Remember, fiber nectin is not calcium binding. That was a question on the quiz. And just know that, like, they attach the bone. They attach the bone to the, to kind of like the, col the collagen and the calcium together. So kind of like bind everything together. Proteoglycans, these are going to be 70% carbs, 30% protein. That was the question. I think it was proteoglycans or glycoproteins. Glycoproteins are more proteins than carbs. Proteoglycans, many glycans means like uncontrolled glycosylation. Uncontrolled means usually you'll have more carbs, so 70% carbs, 30% protein. An example of this is chondroitin sulfate. And this is uh this is gonna be three types. Uh Versigian, I think they're like Vatican City, Vatican came first, kind of Versigian, Biglycan, you already know bi means two, and decorin. Um honestly, I don't think you have to know each individual ones, just know that chondroitin and sulfate is a type of a proteoglycan, which you need for bone formation to happen. Any other details on that? Nah, Heparin sulfate, uh, you, it's thought to help with the osteoblasts and the ECM, so your matrix and the osteoblasts being held together is done by heparin sulfate, and that's, these are, honestly, you just read them over, these are here for you, um, if you can just read them over, osteocalcin was an important one. Majority of calcium binding is done by osteocalcin, um, I don't know, there's no point in me reading it. Osteonectin, just like fiber nectin, except they, it's the most, it's the most abundant density. These are all the major points of these things. So if you just go in the slide, you basically get the major points. I'm not going to repeat everything. But. How are osteoblasts formed? Uh, we know that osteoblasts come from the same like kind of cells as chondroblasts and like the uh, epithelial, so that'd be fibroblasts and stuff. They all came from the same cell line, just the different pathways they took. So you have your stromal stem cell, which can obviously undergo mitosis, and it's a stem cell, so it can, it's pluripotential and can, can, they can like regenerate other stem cells. Then they chose to become progenitor of an osteoblast. So they chose to be an osteoprogenitor. At this point, they've decided on a lineage. They decided they're going to be an osteoblast, osteocyte, one of that lineage things, okay? Obviously, it wants to transition from there. So you have your pre-osteoblast, your osteoblast, and your osteocyte. This is like the normal changes. Think of it this way. And you can think of like mitosis being like the most common here, low here, low here, like very low here. So uh, one of the things that really is key to tell like if they're making bone or not is to measure the alkaline phosphatase. So measuring the alkaline phosphatase will tell you if they're actively making bone. These ones are active, these ones are active, these ones are not, which makes sense because osteocytes are resting cells, they're inactive. What's really interesting is that you have these lining cells which can, which can, become, which can also come from osteoblasts. Lining cells are basically the outside layer of the, of the bone. So they're kind of just waiting around, ready to go back to an osteoblast if they need it. They're also alkaline phosphatase negative, just like osteocytes. So they're both resting until they're given the right signal to go back to this. Okay? Um, that's about it. And increasing differentiation, obviously, because like you lose the mitosis as you differentiate more and more. Osteoblast secrete. So, so osteoblasts will make a couple of things. They'll make an MCSF. This is the my this is the my top. Macrophage colony, colony stability factor, which will stimulate your macro macrophage line, which technically is coming from your monocytes. So your monocytes can become into macrophages, remember? So it will stimulate the monocytes to make osteoclast progenitors. Kind of being like, listen, we have a lot of osteoblast activity. We probably need to balance this out with some osteoclasts. So you will stimulate these monocytes to kind of make these osteo -pro -pro osteoclast precursors. Once you have the osteoclast precursors, you'll express this rank L receptor, as well as they will have, um, anything else I have? Rank L receptor? No. That's about it. They'll have the rank L receptor. So they're ready to be activated whenever they need, whenever they're needed. But for them to be activated, the rank L receptor has to have a rank L ligand bind to it. But the rank L ligand is found in an osteoblast. So the osteoblasts have the rank L ligand to activate them, but they don't until that osteopro. OPG osteoprogenitorin, OTGN, progenitorin. There. So osteo OPG is kind of like sticking on this, inhibiting this interaction. So until that interaction happens, you don't get an osteoblast. So you have the osteoclast progenitor waiting. You have the osteoblast kind of being activated and doing their thing. When that OPG comes off, you'll bind the receptors and you'll activate the osteoclast. So you'll get bone resorption. So when do you activate them? By using. Oh, wait, doesn't have lines in this. Where's my, okay. So there's two things you need to worry about for this one, calcitonin and parathyroid hormone. Calcitonin will interact directly with the osteoclast, saying, inhibit your activity, we have too much bone resorption. So uh, I, I don't know, we don't want to have this on anyway. Maybe it's in like the presenter notes. 
Yeah, I think that's yeah. Anyway, so calcitonin inhibits osteoclasts directly, saying stop absorbing bone, stop resorbing bone, so it stops destroying more bone. On the other hand, parathyroid hormone will act on the osteoblast, saying, you know what, you need to inhibit your activity. So if it doesn't do it directly. What it does is osteoblast will then have the OPG fall off. The rank ligand will bind to the rank L receptor on the osteoclast, and now the osteoclast activity will go up. So the parathyroid hormone indirectly increases bone absorption. Your body releases parathyroid hormone when you're low on calcium. So like breaking down your bones releases more calcium. Exactly. Makes sense. So uh, calcitonin directly on the osteoclast. Parathyroid hormone increases osteoclast activity. Calcitonin toned down. Toned down osteoclast. Osteoclast, yeah, uh, they usually have a ruffled border. That's the uh, surface where they're dissolving at. Uh, they have... Uh, Clear zone, which is okay. Honestly, what's happening is that they're dissolving here. They have this area around it. Um, that's what they call the resorption bay or the Houchip lacuna. That's where they're going to keep all the calcium because if they keep losing all the calcium, they're going to lose it all. So they kind of keep that organized. Um, eventually, it can go through them, it can go around them. Um, anything else? The nucleus is on the periphery. That's nucleus important. on the periphery, and that's really all there was to yeah. the osteoclast. Mesenchyme, osteoclast, woven bone, primary spongia, uh, mature bone, secondary, and then eventually get contact. These are just steps of bone formation. Endochondral, we already did this. This is exactly like explaining bone color, periosteal <laughs> bud, in, injection of that osteoblast, osteocyte, and all that stuff. Osteoclasts will start eating stuff up. Uh, chondrocytes will migrate that way. Chondrocytes will migrate this way because there's still diffusion here. And then what will happen is that the osteoblast will lay down a new matrix for the bone, and eventually calcification will happen in this area, and you'll get your, you'll get your secondary bone. Or your immature bone, sorry, I should say woven bone. And then eventually you get a secondary bone over time as the osteoclast organizing. Okay. So that's how he did it. He showed an example of how that works. The so zone of rest and reserve is up here because that's where the uh, that's where the chondrocytes are at rest. They're not doing anything. Zone of proliferation is right here because that's where the chondrocytes are dividing because they're moving further. They're, think of them moving further away because they have the ability to divide. They have the diffusion coming in. They have more nutrients. They're going to divide and move further away from the from the things where this is happening. This is bone formation. So zone of proliferation, zone of maturation is where... Um, that last sentence, no mycosis. No, no, no. No mycosis in the zone of proliferation should be in the zone of hypertrophy. Oh, I don't know. I didn't know. Okay. Yeah. So zone of proliferation, there is mycosis. It says right here. So it's just ignore the last one. It just, it just includes them. So there is zone of proliferation is mitosis. There's, divide, there's division of chondrocytes. This is chondrocytes here. So the maturation is where the, the matrix is being synthesized. It's um, yeah, completion of the matrix synthesis. So basically they're leaving this kind of behind here because they're maturing, they're moving further away, they're laying down the matrix, they're happy, they're good. What's happening is hypertrophy is enlargement of the lacunae. So underneath that, these chondrocytes are kind of becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and kind of exploding because they're, they're freaking out. They don't have any diffusion coming in. This is the point where the bone color exists. See where the bone color is? Have, there's no diffusion here. So these chondrocytes are kind of freaking out and self-exploding. If you kind of think about it, they're imploding, exploding out. Uh, so enough provisional calcification is where the initial uh, calcium is being laid down. This is not the proper calcium. This has to be reabsorbed and put down properly. Uh, zone of uh, degeneration is where the cartilage is being reabsorbed by the osteoclast. And zone of bone formation is where the calcium is being put down again in the right position for it to be bone. These are, this is just a good slide to look over because on a test, he's going to ask you, like, what zone is this? That's what he's going to do. So yeah, he might ask you where you would yeah. see enlarged, enlarged cells. And you would know a zone of hypertrophy. Yeah, what's the word for the Proliferation. Because this is the one that's expanding the bone. Because this is where the, where the interstitial growth is happening. Because remember, the chondrocytes are dividing here. I mean, when the chondrocytes divide inside the lacuna, that's interstitial growth. So the bone is growing bigger. You could also ask about where the vertical septum is. So the vertical septum is between, so between the lacunae, I mm. guess between oh, the chondrocytes. Oh, yeah. Okay, we actually, no, we actually had a, we actually right here. So, like, see right there. So that's gonna be your, oh. that's gonna be vertical septum. Uh, so, so what happens is between the lacunae, you have a horizontal septum on top, and there's a vertical septum between the chondrocytes. So between the isogenous groups, there's a, there's a vertical septum. So when you reabsorb bone, you destroy the horizontal, you destroy the horizontal, but you leave the vertical near the end, and that's why you see these kind of like. Like these kind of like cave-like structures. Okay? That's the vertical septum. So in a degeneration, we talk about this occurs in the diaphysis, the epiphysis. Diaphysis is the middle of the bone. The epiphysis is the end plate that's over top of the cartilage. Uh, the metaphysis is a transition between the cartilage and the diaphysis. Um, 
that was basically it. Yeah. So lacunae kind of sit like this. They have like the that vert the vertical septum, the horizontal septum. And when you grow bone, you destroy the horizontal, you destroy the horizontal, and you leave this. This is where calcification can happen. Like this. Okay. Bone remodeling. So modeling, you gaining bone. If you have coupling, this is formation with resorption, so you have formation, coupling, right? Uh, bone remodeling regulation, so how do you regulate it? You have to have calcium and phosphate. If you stimulate parathyroid hormone, we know what, what does it do? What does parathyroid hormone do? It indirectly, it increases the activity of osteoclast, but indirectly inhibits the osteo, well, it directly inhibits the osteoblast, but it indirectly increases osteoclast activity. So you're going to resort bone. So you want your first step of remodeling is to take the bone back. You want to, you want to, just, you want to take the calcium out, and then calcitonin will come in, which will then lay down, will then turn off the osteoclast to lay down new bone. Okay. Uh, growth and thyroid hormones. These are going to stimulate your bone formation because growth hormone always think of stimulating factors for bone growth, for cartilage growth, everything growing with growth hormones. Uh, bone morphogenic proteins, BMP, dentin, we know that from uh, in biochemistry last year. It basically just helps with the bone laying down. Okay? These are just these are things just help you with the laying down. Sequence, activation, resorptive phase, reversive phase, formative phase, and completed osseous, which is along this phase. Formation is what, yeah, exactly. Well, yeah, I think how long it takes for your bone to form. Exactly. So, um, yeah. And that's basically, so activation can happen and it can stay in the completed phase for as long as it needs until it goes back to the resorption phase for whatever reason. And that's basically it. And that's how ships lacuna or resorption area. Interstitial lamella, this is basically what you get when you kind of eat the bone away and you leave those little pieces around the osteons. That's the interstitial lamina because what happened was you ate the bone, you put the new osteon down, but there's still like this old bone still left here, the old osteon, and you didn't dissolve that, so you get the interstitial lamina. That's what the pizza pie, he said, like you eat the pizza pie, you leave a little piece behind, that's the interstitial lamina. Okay. And we saw these because we saw the osteon and you laid a new one, and you have this like old one now still left, which is gonna be your interstitial lamina. Disease and fractures. Okay. So there's certain ones that you definitely need to know. Um, he's going to ask you to differentiate between rickets and osteomalacia. It's just basically which one happens in adults versus which one happens in um, kids, right? Vitamin C, you guys already know um, as scurvy, but it also affects the epiphyseal plate, okay? And it's distortion. I asked him, what does that exactly mean? He, could, he didn't really have an answer for it. Okay, <laughs> so we're going with distortion. Um, but you do need to know that an increased vitamin A versus decreased vitamin A, it changes the thickness of the epiphyseal plate. Okay, so what would it do when you have excess of vitamin A? What? High vitamin A with less bone can make more. More. You got more bone. Yeah. So vitamin A is decreasing. What do you mean? No, oh, that's, 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 that's oh, the yeah. The, the thickness. Okay. Yeah, okay. So know that he's going to ask about excess versus deficiency, okay, for vitamin A. Okay. Uh, vitamin C and D, it's just going to be deficiency. Cool? Okay. Um, osteoporosis versus osteopetrosis. Petrosis is packed, okay? Think of it as petrosis packed, okay? Versus porosis, porous, right? Um, and that's the way you want to think about it. Okay, this is probably, I think, one of the last slides. Um, fracture, what happens first? You first get injury and your blood vessels are, you know, bleeding, basically, right? So you're going to get a blood clot first, okay? Blood clot first. The main things that you want to take away from this is going to be the calluses, okay? Um, he mentions this as blood injury, and then you have periosteal callus, because what it wants to do is it wants to form the layers first, the periosteal layers, so that it can start regenerating inside. So you're going to get periosteal callus and then hyaline cartilage callus, because what happens is when you block it off, the vessels, there, there's you know, probably clot there, but it's not really you know, providing nutrition for these bones to regenerate. So highly cartilage needs to form first, which is like in what kind of bone formation? When you have cartilage formation first, 
and then you get the phone. Exactly. Right? And O'Connor. Um, so that's exactly what's happening here with injury. So whenever you go fracture and injury, it follows the same sequence as endocondylitis. Perfect. So it goes periosteocalus, hyaline cartilage, calus, and then you get the bone calus. Okay. All the while, um, this resorption is happening. I asked him when is this sequence actually happening. Um, he's saying that this happens throughout the whole calus formation, the resorption, um, until the collateral circulation comes in. Okay. So know it in that sense. The sequence that you need to know are the calluses. Okay. Cool. Okay. So um, that's it. Yeah, that is it. Uh, I just put like six questions here that you might expect from Dr. Lee. I don't know if that helps at all. Uh, but other than that, that is it for neuroscience and basic tissues. Um, we scheduled it so that you would have, you know, some time before you go on to OMS, um, the conference practice.